Svetok, and I'm a solutions engineer at Google, and I work very closely with uh, Google Cloud Dataflow. And specifically today, I want to talk to you about how you can use the Dataflow runner uh, to run your Beam pipelines. So the agenda of this talk is as follows. So I want to first give an overview of what the Dataflow ar runner architecture looks like. And then I want to talk about some of the core features that we have in the Dataflow runner. Uh, I also then want to talk about some horizontal services integrations that we have with other Google Cloud, um, you know, parts of the Google Cloud ecosystem that you can leverage to, um, you know, more efficiently run your Beam pipelines. And finally, I want to talk about some of the newer Dataflow Runner features that we've recently introduced. Great. So to start with, I want to talk about four key things that are really part of this Google Cloud Dataflow uh, architecture. So first, I want to talk about graph optimization. Then I want to talk about resource auto scaling. And finally, I want to touch on monitoring and logging, um, which are key things for running uh, any Beam pipeline. So to start with uh, graph optimization, you can really think of this as something similar to compiler optimization in the sense that uh, we can oftentimes skew steps to more efficiently run a pipeline. And this happens sort of without the knowledge of the person you know, spinning up the Beam code. This is just how it's executed. And you know, this is really useful because you don't have to realize or materialize every intermediate uh, P collection or record per se. Um, it's just more efficient uh, to sort of execute that graph structure of your Beam pipeline. So next, I want to touch on some key data flow features that we have in our UI itself. So you can get to this page by going to Pantheon, which is the Google Cloud console. And you can go to Dataflow and click on your specific Dataflow job ID. And it'll take you to a page that looks like this. And so we have a few things here. Um, we have our job execution graph, which is going to be our graph structure of how our Beam pipeline is going to execute. And then we have what we, have, what we call job metrics. And these are going to be really valuable things um, to know how your pipeline is being executed. Uh, so things like your CPU utilization or things like your resource auto scaling um, can all sort of be verified and understood on this page. Also on the right pane, we have uh, you know, some job info. So we have things like uh, you know, what experiments we've passed in, uh, things like maybe what our max number of workers have been set at uh, to run our pipeline, and you know, key things that we've passed in uh, that we can sort of track and verify on our own. Uh, that's you know, easy, to, easy to have on the UI just for debugging purposes. And if you look on the bottom, you see a small snippet of uh, logging. And if you actually expand that page out, that'll take you to our Google Cloud logging uh, page. And this is going to be really, really useful for, of course, debugging your pipelines, as you all know. So you can see things here that you might not be able to see otherwise, such as you know, things like your, work or your workers failing to start up, or you know, if there's an error in some part of the pipeline, it'll all be logged here. And you know, we have different levels of logs. So we have things like our info level logs, which is just things that are going on. And we have things like critical uh, logs or error level logs, which you know, they really point to something that's you know, a core issue that might be stopping the pipeline from executing. And this is often where you want to go to start uh, you know, debugging the pipelines. And additionally, I wanted to add that you can also uh, use a lot of filters in Google Cloud logging. So you can look for things like specific timestamps, or you can look for specific error messages that you know, can really just speed up uh, the debugging process. So next, I want to touch on uh, three uh, horizontal integrations that we have with other parts of Google Cloud, namely Cloud IAM, uh, Compute Engine, and Cloud Networking. But as I want to talk about that, I also first want to talk about sort of what happens uh, di or architecturally uh, when a user submits their Beam pipeline code uh, to you know, run it on the Dataflow runner. So essentially, what is going to happen is, like on the left, the user is going to write their pipeline code using maybe the Java or the Python SDK. And you know, they're going to submit it to our regional endpoint. And this is going to get converted into a graph, so a graph representation of what's going to happen in the Beam pipeline. And so this is going to be sent to our job manager, which is our regional endpoint. You can think of this also like our primary worker. And Simultaneously, it's going to send a copy of this to Google Cloud Storage so that 
our secondary workers, uh, as you'll see in a minute, can actually access. So what's going to happen here is that our regional endpoint or our primary worker is going to schedule or lease work to our secondary workers. <clears throat> so it's going to decide you know, how it's going to lease the work. And there is an element of randomness to this, but it's going to figure out you know, how much work to lease uh, you know, secondary worker A versus secondary worker B. And you know, these are all compute engine instances. So uh, to go on further, the regional endpoint here corresponds to our primary worker. And you know, the regional endpoint is going to be where the, uh, you know, this is going to, this is going to be what, uh, this is going to be what deploys and controls data flow workers and stores, you know, your job metadata. And it's going to be set to US central one uh, by default. Now our zone on the other hand is going to correspond to where our secondary workers are. So it's going to define the location of where these secondary workers that are actually executing your work are. And sometimes you may not want the zone to be uh, in the same region as the regional endpoint. And this could be for things such as data resiliency or maybe some security and compliance reasons. But of course, if you do want to have these two uh, in different uh, regions, you'll have to take into account that there might be some network latency uh, talking over the region uh, or talking over the network to the different regions. So now I want to talk about our identity and access management. So with the Dataflow runner, there are two service accounts that are absolutely mandatory uh, to be able to run uh, a Beam job on Dataflow uh, runner. So the first one is the Dataflow service account. And this also corresponds to our primary worker here. Um, you know, this, the, the account is going to be sort of in the form that's listed on that PowerPoint uh, on, on the slide deck. And um, you can see that this is really clearly just used for creating your workers and you know, things like monitoring uh, versus your controller service account, which is going to take the form of uh, what's on the slide. And that's going to be really useful for your secondary workers. So this is going to give them the appropriate permissions to maybe access you know, files on Google Cloud Storage uh, bucket. Um, and this is really going to give them the permissions to actually execute the job. Great. So now I'm going to talk about some of the other features that uh, the Dataflow service has to offer. So like I mentioned before, the primary worker is going to lease work to the secondary workers. And so when the work is leased, uh, you know, there's sometimes an element of randomness. So sometimes uh, the primary wor worker might give worker A a lot of work and worker B, you know, barely any work. And so sometimes if we're, uh, you know, one worker gets too much work and the rest of the workers don't have much work at all, uh, it creates sort of an uneven distribution. Uh, and this is what's commonly known as the hot key issue in data processing. So this is going to really stall the job. And this is really going to delay the parallel processing uh, because one worker just has so much work to do and the rest of the workers have hardly any work to do. And so we have a feature known as batch dynamic work redistribution to redistribute the work that's you know, given to these secondary workers. And it's fully automated. So uh, the person running the Beam pipeline wouldn't actually even be completely aware of, of this. Great. So now the next thing I want to touch on is our Dataflow shuffle service, which uh, this is used for batch jobs specifically. So suppose that you have a Beam pipeline, and maybe in one step, you have a really sort of heavy operation, such as group by, or co-group by, or combine. Right? So you have a very heavy operation. What the shuffle service is going to do is it's going to take where this operation is being executed. It's going to send it over to the shuffle service. The shuffle service will you know, carry out that operation, and it will send the result back. And the pipeline will continue executing as normal. So why might you want to do this? Um, things like time that it takes the job to complete so it can be faster, uh, things such as CPU utilization or resource utilization, um, or even more efficient use of auto scaling. So you can think of the Dataflow streaming engine as analogous to the, uh, the shuffle service that I just mentioned, uh, except for a streaming Dataflow job. So perhaps you have a streaming pipeline and you, know, you have a couple of heavy operations in the pipeline. You can just send that over to the streaming engine to carry out the intensive computations. And it'll sort of get sent back to your pipeline right after and continue executing as normal. So you have a lot of key benefits here again. Like I just mentioned, the auto scaling is a lot smoother. Um, and a lot of times, the resources uh, that are consumed are overall less. So 
you will get this recommendation a lot. Uh, you know, say you have a very computationally intensive streaming pipeline. Uh, oftentimes, streaming engine uh, being enabled is the best way forward. Great. Now I want to talk about our Dataflow SQL UI, which can be used to run Beam SQL. So, uh, like you know, in Beam SQL, you can write actual SQL queries that can actually trigger Dataflow jobs. So, in the case of you know using Dataflow Runner, you can write this in what we have, what we know as BigQuery, which is um, our data warehousing service. So you can actually write this Beam SQL uh, in BigQuery, and you can execute it, and you know you can submit and launch Dataflow jobs. And you know this is really good here because you know people that might not have you know like great Java or Python development experience can trigger Dataflow jobs you know just with using SQL. So it's it's definitely much simpler and much more accessible. Great. And now our flexible resource scheduling. So we have two types of VMs. Uh, we have our standard VMs, which is almost everything that I've been referring to previously in the slide. Uh, you know you can use standard VMs for. We also have preemptible VMs, which are sort of short-lived VMs, um, and they they're ephemeral in nature, which means that you know they're there for about 24 hours. Uh, and so a lot of times, if you're using you know flexible resource scheduling, you might want a mix of the two. And the reason you want to mix is you know if a preemptible VM dies out, your job can. That using preemptible VMs is sometimes really useful, and also, of course, uh, cost. Dataflow templates is something I also want to touch on, which is uh, one of our newer uh, one of our newer releases, and you know, more and more keep getting added. But essentially, this is really useful because one, there's no coding required, but two, you can actually just specify things like your sources and sinks. And you can you can stage a template, and then you can launch uh, the job from the template. And we have two types of templates. So we have classic templates and flex templates. Now, in both of these templates, the big advantage is that the code doesn't have to get recompiled every time. So you already have the code, and you can just launch a job. So it should be faster. Now, the difference between classic templates and flex templates are that in classic templates, the job execution graph is uh, created during the staging phase, so when you're staging your template. Versus in flex templates, uh, the job execution graph is created when you're actually launching the pipeline. So you can imagine with flex templates, you have a little more flexibility with uh, what you can specify. So things like your sources and sinks can be edited and other sort of minor details within the pipeline. Another thing that we've recently announced is GPU support. So you can basically just tack on a GPU to your VMs, and this can really accelerate training, just like you know you would do when you're running something like some ML training on your local machine. Uh, you can attach GPUs uh, to the VMs, and this is going to really speed up uh, basically training for ML model training or you know something like streaming prediction predictions uh, with the use of a GPU. Now, Dataflow Prime is one of our newer uh, one of our newer um, releases that we've very very recently just uh, actually opened up, and I want to talk about three key things that really differentiates Dataflow Dataflow Prime from you know Dataflow regularly. So we have serverless auto tuning infrastructure, we have serverless smart diagnostics, and we have a simplified billing model. So I don't want to talk too much about the simplified billing model, but just know that the billing model is definitely different uh, than what's in our regular data flow offering. Uh, serverless auto-tuning infrastructure is very useful. And the motivation behind this is that we often see a lot of customers uh, playing around with parameters such as max num workers, uh, the memory that needs to be in each of the workers. And a lot of times it was trial and error. So they would have to kind of uh, look to see, you know, how are my how's my pipeline running? If I change this, will my pipeline run faster or will it run slower? Um, sort of, it's it's a lot of trial and error. And oftentimes they would, you know, contact us and they would, you know, tell us there's something wrong with the pipeline. And we would also have to sometimes say, you know, maybe try changing this, uh, you know, the amount of memory on your workers, uh, or et cetera, something like that. So serverless auto tuning infrastructure is essentially going to uh, optimize how much uh, memory should be in the workers based on how much uh, consumption is being used by your data by your beam job, 
And this is going to be, this can change in real time. So it's almost like a smarter way of doing things uh, rather than manual trial and error. And serverless smart diagnostics. So essentially, you know, distributed systems, especially, uh, you know, the cloud world, they oftentimes the goal is to just run like magic. And so when you have to debug them, you're often sometimes in trouble. So we've come out with a set of uh, features that have sort of uh, assist you to, you know, debug these uh, distributed systems. So things like our job visualizer that shows you how the job is actually executing can tell you for sure if something is a hot key or not, uh, in which case you wouldn't have to, you know, contact us to check if, you know, you have the hot key issue. So this is sort of uh, just a small glimpse of what Dataflow Prime is to offer, and you'll definitely be hearing more about it in the coming uh, weeks and months. So with that, I want to end there, and you know, here's a brief summary of what we've covered, and you know, I welcome sort of any questions.